What a treat it is to be with you. Now the second Sunday that I have come to stand in this sacred pulpit and share the word of God with you. I'm honored, I'm humbled, as I said last week, and I am grateful. Thank you for your warmth, your hospitality, for making me feel already at home. I deeply appreciate that. Thank you, choir, instrumentalist, everybody who has led us in worship today. They have ushered us into the presence of God, and that is exactly where we are, and that's exactly where we need to be. One of the pleasant surprises that I have encountered in coming the last two Sundays to Lexington to preach is the drive between Frankfurt and Lexington. I live in Frankfurt. I live on the east side. Normally when I'm coming to Lexington, I love to drive the old Frankfurt Pike. That's the one I prefer. That's my first choice. But I don't want to be late for that 6 o'clock service we have on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and so I come on 421. What I have discovered, though, the last two Sundays, and especially today, is that it is absolutely gorgeous what I am witnessing as I drive. Because of the time change, the sun is just peeking over the horizon when I am heading this way due east. And I'm watching the sun as it comes up. And today there wasn't a cloud in the sky. There were no distractions. It was just that big ball of orange coming up. And it was beautiful. And then I looked over and I saw the mist coming off of the ponds because of the cool air. I saw frost in the fields. It reminded me of the kind of morning I always dream about on Thanksgiving Day. And it was much like that. I'm glad we're going into spring and not winter, but it was that kind of morning. So thank you for that. Uh, that is, that is uh, a blessing that I was not prepared for. And it helped me to even begin worshiping as I drive over. And then to come and be with you adds to the joy. Thank you so much. This morning, we are going to be traveling down the road that leads from hope to disappointment. Now, wait just a minute. I want to make sure that you understood what I just said. We're going to be traveling down a road that leads from hope to disappointment. I know you would rather hear a sermon about traveling from disappointment to hope. I would rather preach a sermon about traveling from disappointment, discouragement, despair to hope, but that is not where this text takes us. I don't think you're unfamiliar with this road, this road that leads from hope to disappointment. Maybe you experienced it yesterday, between 5 and 5.30 in the afternoon. Some of you might have been watching television. And with about three minutes to go in a certain game, I shall not name, one team was ahead by, what, eight points? And hope was just rising to the point we, we could actually sit down and watch the game without pacing. We didn't have to go outside. We didn't have to change the channel. We could just sit and enjoy the last three minutes of the game because hope was rising with every bounce of the ball and we just knew the outcome. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, hope began changing to disappointment and despair and the realization this didn't turn out the way I thought it would. May I remind you, though, the 2012 team that won the national championship did not win the SEC tournament. <laughs> I still like our team. Jesus is on the road from hope to disappointment. And with every step he takes now, it's crushing his spirit. You've been there. 
You've experienced that. You know what it's like. I don't want to take another step. I don't want to go in this direction any longer. I want to turn around. I want to go back toward hope and not continue on this path. You see, he's come near the end of his ministry. And it is painfully aware, he is painfully aware now that all he wanted to accomplish and all he wanted to do for the people that he loved so dearly, he was not going to be able to do. Resistance was growing. It was growing stronger and broader every day. His words, his work, his very presence angered people, people with a lot of power. And he was so disappointed. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. And I think about the words that, very similar words that he repeated when he is cresting the Mount of Olives Palm Sunday as he's riding into the city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had known what would bring you peace this day. But it is not to be. You have rejected the best thing God ever did for you and sent to you. The source of this resistance that is so apparent to him now that it is going to end his life. The source of this resistance, where is it coming from? There are two places. One, you will not be surprised. The other one, you might. Some Pharisees came to Jesus. I, first of all, I don't know what their motive was in this particular passage. I don't know the motive of the Pharisees. I, I want to say they had pure hearts here. They were concerned about Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, that would not be uncommon. Luke's pretty friendly toward the Pharisees sometimes, more than Matthew, Mark, John. So we could give them the benefit of the doubt and say, yes, they're concerned about the welfare of Jesus, and they say, Herod wants to kill you. You need to leave our, our town. Then there's that cynical side of me that says, they just wanted to get Jesus out of their town because it was creating some disturbances, what he was saying, what he was doing. And this is the best way to get him out because if he realizes Herod wants to kill him, Herod is the Roman leader of this region, the secular Roman leader. Well, if Herod wants to kill him, he is going to leave and flee for his life like anybody would do. So Herod wants to kill you. Why they did that, we're not sure. So that identifies the first source of resistance. Herod killed any rival to his power, including family members, a little bit like the North Korean leader. So paranoid, paranoid and jealous. Herod wants to kill you. Well, if Herod wants to kill you, <laughs> If he's put you on his most wanted list, you better run. Herod gets what Herod wants. But then there's another source of resistance here to Jesus. And I, I think you could be surprised by this. This source of resistance comes from the religious leaders of his day and time. Not all of them. I don't paint with a broad brush here. No. Not all the religious leaders, but those who held the highest reins of power. They are opposed to Jesus. They question everything he teaches. They complain about every miracle, how he did it and when he did it. They're constantly criticizing him. They set traps for him so that in public, they can ask him those gotcha questions and just humiliate him. And they spread rumors to discredit him. And these are religious people. Not all 
religious people are good people. So that's the source of the resistance. Why? You have to, and and, in, in this passage, Luke is making a case here. He's making a case for the crucifixion of Jesus. We're in the season of Lent, 40 days before Easter, not including the six Sundays. And Luke is making a case for the crucifixion of Jesus. And he's telling us the resistance is just mounting every day, coming from secular and religious leaders. So you have to ask yourself two questions. Why were they so opposed to Jesus? And what was his reaction? You know why they were upset with him, especially the religious leaders? Because he assumed the role of a prophet. Remember in this passage, a prophet cannot die outside of Jerusalem. He was a prophet among many other things. And he assumed the role of a prophet. And how were the prophets in the Old Testament treated for the most part? You might want to think twice before you become a prophet. Jesus spoke truth to power. And he blamed, laid the blame for many of the world's problems at the feet of the religious leaders of his day and time. He held them responsible and accountable and he called on them to repent. He was not timid or shy. Oh, Jesus was a prophet. Bold. He wasn't timid or shy, especially when it came to pointing out the faults of the religious leaders. He exposed their hypocrisy, their addictions to power and prestige and pleasure and money and the lavish lifestyles they lived. He criticized the religious leaders for using their power and influence for personal gain. He denounced them for making life harder for those who were struggling to survive. He called them out for being selfish and greedy, rude and arrogant, insensitive and cruel. And he challenged them to embrace kingdom values and to denounce the world's priorities by pursuing love over hate serving over being served, sacrifice over self-indulgence. Oh, there is no doubt. Jesus' words and his work created conflict between him and those who, con- cho- those who chose to control people rather than serve them. I think you see why the religious leaders and even Herod turned on Jesus. His voice had to be silenced. His ministry had to be ended. He was too big a threat to them and the power structure that worked to their benefit. So what was the reaction of Jesus? How did he respond to all this mounting resistance? Well, he was not surprised. Neither was he intimidated. And he had two responses. One, he called Herod what? (laughs) A sly, conniving, deceitful, destructive, and self-absorbed fox. Furthermore, he renewed his commitment to the work God sent him to do, and he continued right on his way to Jerusalem, the eye of the storm. But he had another reaction. Another response. And it expressed the longings of his broken heart. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I long to gather your children together as a hen, her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. He was heartbroken. Remember what I told you last week when I come on Sunday? I'm going to share with you what I have learned from my study of the previous week. 
So let's ask the question today, how does this text and this story intersect with our lives today and this week? First of all, nothing of great value comes easily. Nothing of great value comes easily. Every dreamer will encounter a variety of struggles in his or her efforts to make their dreams come true. It was true for Jesus, true for the disciples, true for the early Christians in the first generation. It will be true for us. All the honorable motives and good intentions that dreamers bring to the table don't take the challenges out of what they're trying to accomplish. There will be no shortages of mountains to scale, valleys to go through, and unpaved roads to navigate on the path that leads to a new and better life for everybody. And only the highest level of commitment to a noble cause will keep you in the game. If you are unwilling to take risks, if you are unwilling to pay a high price for making dreams come true, then stay on the sidelines you will not make it through the first quarter. Nothing of great value comes easily. Secondly, choose faith over fear. When you meet with a resistance that is grounded in selfishness and flows from a deceitful heart, always choose faith over fear. Never, never, never give up. When someone tries to sabotage your good work, be as bold and determined and committed and courageous as Jesus was. The day he was told, oh, by the way, Herod wants to kill you. If God be for us, who can be against us? Paul wrote to the Romans. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Always keep your eyes on God and your mind focused upon your mission. Do not let your adversaries distract you. They are using fear to manipulate and control you. Thirdly, nothing of great value comes easily. Choose faith over fear and rely upon God when you meet with resistance. And then thirdly, and I'd never seen this in this text until last week. Not everyone you love will let you help them. Not everyone you love will let you help them. Sometimes the resistance we face comes from those we know the best and love the most. Tragically, it can be family members, it can be dear friends who do not want what you have to offer, even if it is in their best interest. They will not appreciate what you are trying to do on their behalf to keep them from going down a path that leads to death and destruction. And it will break your heart and has broken your heart just as Jesus' heart was broken. The hardest he cried in the New Testament, he didn't cry often, but the hardest he cried, the way it's described, the way it is written, is the time that he topped the Mount of Olives, Palm Sunday, riding that getting ready to ride that donkey into, the Mount of, into Jerusalem. And he topped the Mount of Olives, and there he saw the city. And that's when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, if only you had known what would bring you peace, but you rejected the peace that God sent you. And he broke down and cried. What's different this time in this passage from that passage on Palm Sunday is he cried. It is the strongest description of Jesus crying in the Bible, uncontrollable tears. 
your heart will be broken when the people you love the most and want to help more than anything else will not let you do it. I was given a question by God last week to ask you, and I know it came directly from him. Is there anything more painful than watching someone you love self-destruct? Is there anything more painful than watching someone you love self-destruct? I, I don't think so. I don't know what it would be. And I think Jesus would probably agree. This may be how this story connects with you today. Someone near and dear to you is heading down the wrong road because they are making unwise decisions and yet they refuse your efforts to help them make better choices. How many tears have you shed? How many times have you tried to reach them? How many ways have you tried to reason with them? How many opportunities you provided for a new and better life for them have been squandered? How often have your attempts to help them been ignored? What could I say to you today that would encourage you? Perhaps it is this. I think there is a special place in God's heart for those who weep over others. I think there's a special place in God's heart for those who weep over others, who make sacrifices on their behalf and do not give up when others walk away. God knows what it's like to be discouraged. He knows what it's like to be heartbroken. He knows what it's like to travel from hope to disappointment. God is aware that sorrow is an expression of steadfast, unconditional love. So the same God who helped Jesus to be faithful all the way to the cross will help you to persevere. And the one who portrayed was portrayed in this passage as a hen protecting her chicks or even a shepherd willing to search for every lost sheep will empower you to be a good role model and to keep searching for the person you're trying to reach. God knows how hard it is to travel from the road, down the road from hope to disappointment. And this is why God will take every step with you on that difficult journey. And I pray today you are and you will let him help you. But I have one final thing to say. If you are the one and you're here today or maybe you're listening on YouTube, radio, if you are the one who is breaking someone's heart by heading down the wrong road, the road of destruction, God will help you too to make tough changes in your life. God loves you unconditionally and will help you turn from your self-destructive ways. God will forgive and heal and help. So think twice before you walk away from somebody who is your prophet sent to you by God, someone who is honest with you and trying to help you live a better life. Ask yourself what they know you don't, what they see you are overlooking. And this morning, I plead with you, if you're heading down the road of self-destruction, put down your defenses, lay aside your pride, listen to the people who love you unconditionally and reconsider the decisions you are making. Turn from disappointment and destruction toward hope and healing. This is my prayer for you and I'm confident many other people are praying that same prayer. Would you bow with me? Continue to speak during this invitation. Wherever this intersects our hearts and lives today and this week, will you come, show us, help us.
For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.